This is Morning Prayers at St. Peter's, Ipswich, brought to you online, a place where we study God's Word together and where we join our hearts and our voices before the throne of God, praying for the needs of our world, our church and ourselves. Welcome this morning. Good morning and welcome to Morning Prayers from St. Peter's Church, Ipswich in Redditch. My name is Chris McLaren, and my husband, Peter, who is with me, will be sharing thoughts from God's word this morning. So some opening prayers. Oh Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Hear our voice, O Lord, according to your faithful love. According to your judgment, give us life. Blessed are you, God of compassion and mercy. To you be praise and glory forever. In the darkness of our sin, your light breaks forth like the dawn and your healing springs up for deliverance. As we rejoice in the gift of your saving help, sustain us with your bountiful spirit and open our lips to sing your praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from Psalm 91, and this is part of the reading set for today, which is celebrated as St. Patrick's Day, particularly in Northern Ireland, but elsewhere around the world. So Psalm 91 Ash, we're reading the first four verses and then from verse 13 to the end of the psalm. So Psalm, <coughs> excuse me, Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, in my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the foulest snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. And then verse 13. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Peter and I are now going to share a canticle that is set as a song of the word of the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Return to the Lord who will have mercy. To our God who will richly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from above, and return not again but water the earth. Bringing forth life and giving growth. Seed for sowing and bread to eat. So is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me fruitless. But it will accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the task I gave it. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father and to the Son and to the, Son, and to the, the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the, the beginning, beginning, is now. now and, and shall, shall be, be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. And that song based on Isaiah 53. 
leads us into the second reading, which Peter is going to read for us and then share his thoughts from it. Our second reading is a New Testament reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, the first 12 verses, and then verses 17 to 20. It's a reading that's particularly appropriate so the prayer book tells us, for saints' days. Luke 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you, are enter, you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day than Sodom, uh, than for that town. Later, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to tr trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And we thank God indeed for this, his word. Amen. Peter, your thoughts. So good morning to you all. On this Working Wednesday, Unless, of course, you're watching this service from Northern Ireland or even the Irish Republic, where it's a bank holiday for today, St. Patrick's Day. And Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland, together with Bridget of Kildare and Columba. Now, it's perhaps a bit presumptuous as someone who's only been to Ireland for one long weekend in his life to speak about an Irish Christian leader. But since I am of Scottish descent through my father and of Cornish descent through my mother, I hope that qualifies me as a suitable Celt. The only time my wife and I went to Ireland was to see a friend of ours ordained into the Anglican ministry in Cork Cathedral. And we will certainly be praying for her today. Make sure you pray for all your Irish friends today. Now I've been looking at some of the history of Patrick. He was born somewhere on the west coast of Britain around the year 390, was captured by Irish raiders when he was 16 year old and taken to Ireland as a slave. 
After six years, he escaped. He eventually found his way back to his own family, where his previously nominal Christian faith grew and matured. He returned to Gaul and was there trained as a priest in Auxerre, which is, of course, a twin city of Redditch, and was much influenced by the form of monasticism, which evolved, which was evolving under Martin of Tours. When he was in his early 40s, he returned to Ireland as a bishop and made his base in Amar. He evangelised the people of the land by walking all over Ireland, gently bringing men and women to a knowledge of Christ. Now, as I've studied the life of Patrick, the thing that has amazed me is how little we really know about him historically. I looked up the great Roman Catholic encyclopedia online and it gives his death as four at, in 493 or maybe 460 or 461. That's over a 30 year difference. And my dictionary of the Christian church is even more vague. The first sentence in the entry reads, Patrick's dates, origins and career have long provoked controversy among historians. The article is full of vague statements. It seems highly probable that his birthplace was near Dumblart Barton. He was captured as a slave, age 16, taken to Ireland, where he escaped after six years and made a sea passage, probably to Scotland. He returned to Ireland in about 432. His ministry and wanderings in Ireland for the next 30 years are obscure, though the subject of many legends. There is no doubt that he broke the power of heathenism in Ireland and that his teaching was scriptural and evangelical. He was buried probably in Downpatrick. So you can see the certainties are very few. So although we know relatively little about Patrick, this what we do know comes from two of his short writings, the Confessions and the Letter to the Christian Subjects of the Tyrant Corotheus. But what we do know shows that he was a brave, ungodly Christian leader in difficult circumstances. But the question arises, why are the facts about him so very thin? There are at least two reasons. Shortly before he was called to Ireland, another Christian teacher, Palladius, was sent to Ireland and spent some time there. It is possible that accounts of the two leaders have been confused and combined by others writing at a later date. Secondly, imaginative writers, writing actually many hundreds of years later, made up stories of what they thought Patrick would have done or should have done. And my dictionary describes these stories as many medieval traditions which are largely valueless. So today, as we think of a Christian leader of the past who wrestled with great difficulties, let us consider how we might wrestle with the power of Christ in the difficulties we face today. But there is one very big issue we must face. 
There have been many innumerable attacks on the Christian faith in the last century, and many of them are based on the same two points that we have noted about Patrick. One, that the crucifixion never happened. Someone else died instead, i.e. factual error. Secondly, all the accounts from the New Testament were written several hundred years after the events, so many of the stories are wishful fables. Now, the first of these points is one that is made by many Muslims and is a crucial point that we need to consider and explain in drawing our Muslim friends to a true faith in Christ. My translation of the Quran into English says this. Verily, we have slain Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God. Yet they slew him not, neither crucified him, but he was represented by one in his likeness. They didn't really kill him, but God took him up to himself. For God is mighty and wise. Muslims do not believe that Jesus actually died on the cross and believe that someone, probably Judas Iscariot, was substituted for him. Now Christians have to be very sure about these things. And the matter is clearly stated by the Apostle Peter on his first sermon on the day of Pentecost. And we read it from Acts 2, verses 22 onwards. Men of Israel, he says, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. In fact, the Apostle Paul makes this the crucial test of whether a person is a Christian. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This vital fundamental point of the Christian faith is an essential that we must grasp and proclaim to the world this Easter. Now, the second attack on faith came a hundred or more years ago when non-believing scholars tried to state that the New Testament documents were written several hundred years after the events they portray. One scholarship has shown that these attempts are false. My commentary on Luke by Leon Morris the former principal of Ridley College, Melbourne, discusses the date of the gospel, that's the gospel we read from today, in significant detail and comes up with a date of the early 60s, i.e. about 30 years after the death of Jesus. With the sequel, the Book of Acts, According to my commentary written by the famous scholar Howard Marshall, was written towards AD 70. 
So both of Luke's accounts were in written form within 30 or so years of the first Easter, when there were still many people around who were eyewitnesses of these great events. In fact, these ideas of manufactured events came even shortly after the resurrection, as Matthew reports, if you want to look at it in Matthew 28, from verses 11 to 15. But the Apostle Peter clarified these events in a sec his second letter. He says this in 2 Peter 1, 16. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So as today we give thanks for God's work in Ireland through Patrick and other leaders there in former and current times, let us this Lent season go back to the roots of our faith and remember, as Peter continues to tell us, we have the words of the prophets made more certain and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Amen. And so may that morning star rise in our hearts, our parish and our world at this Easter time. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Peter. And we come now to our time of prayer. We're going to start by praying for the church. And there'll be a moment of quiet whilst we can remember our leaders here in this parish, both ordained and, and lay. Remember too, the churches that we have connections with either from attending it in the past or knowing about it in the present. We also pray too for all the members of the various congregations across the parish of Ipsley, mm. that God would continue to keep and uphold them as we await the easing of lockdown. So a moment of quiet. Mm. Lord of the church and of the church's mission, strengthen your church where she is weak. Guard your church where she is strong. Renew your church where she has lost her vision. Give her humility where she is proud. Grant that her members may serve you with joy and fulfill your purposes with delight. Deepen the faith of your people as they proclaim the good news of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world and its leaders. So again, a moment of quiet as we think of all those in authority and with the burden of leadership, both here in the UK and especially in those countries where there is unrest of one kind or another. And we think of places like Myanmar. Lord God, we bring before you this morning all those in authority, both here within the UK and around the world. These leaders are seeking to deal with a serious pandemic and the effects on their nation. To do this, Lord, they need your wisdom and help 
even when they don't acknowledge you. Father, we cry out to you to give them that wisdom, insight, and a sense of caring responsibility they need at this time. And we will pray too for the scientists, for medical staff, and others who are seeking to support and bring healing to all affected by COVID. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray now for all those who serve. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all those men and women who seek to help and support all those within our community, sometimes putting their own lives at risk. So Lord, we think of our police. For our fire service personnel. For medical staff, whether within the hospital or locally within medical centres. Lord, remember too, those who are working as part of the vaccination programme. We pray for those who visit the vulnerable in their own homes. We pray for the teachers and others within our schools as they seek to restart the education of so many children. We pray too for all those who serve in our shops or deliver to our doors. We thank you for them and ask that they may be kept safe and able to do their work without hindrance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we pray for those in need, a moment of quiet, whilst we think of anyone we know in any particular need at this time. It could be those names mentioned in the catch. It could be people known personally to us. Heavenly Father, we bring to you this morning all those who are ill, whether at home or in hospital. We remember those going into hospital for treatment today. We pray for those struggling with mental health issues. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one or are looking after a loved one in end of life care. Amen. We pray for those struggling within the home situation. And we pray, Lord, for any others known only to you. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And we conclude our prayers this morning with part of the prayer that we know as St. Patrick's breastplate. Christ with me. Christ before me. Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, 
Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in every eye that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Amen. And so may God bless each one of us today and in the days ahead. Amen. Amen. So we thank you for being with us this morning and we look forward to being with you tomorrow, Thursday. <laughs>